I'm Warren Leon, and I'm the new chair of the Light Board. We're going to um, do this meeting in a slightly different order than normal, but let's start with minutes and upcoming meetings. And your agenda, you saw the upcoming meetings. Um, John has several minutes that I believe he wants to ask us to approve. John. Yes, thank you, Warren. Um, I was uh, coming to the meeting a little late and uh, collecting myself. Um, I don't have the explicit dates uh, for the minutes um, that I would ask you to approve, but I did distribute some minutes um, over the weekend. I have the the dates if you want, uh, John. That would be well, great. Hey, Brian, why don't you make a motion to approve those minutes and include the date in your motion? Uh, well, there's there was one set, I think November was one that we had approved, so I'm not going to list that one. Um, you should approve it or list it anyway, right. because we did make a change. There was a an erroneous um, vote that appeared at the end of that from AI. So we've updated that. Oh, all right. Well, um, is I, just before I make the motion, is there any deliberation? I don't, I didn't see any. Um, so I move that we approve the minutes for uh, November 15th, 2023, April 24th, 2024, December 20th, 2023, May 8th, 2024, and November 29th, 2023. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay. John, second. Any discussion? No. Um, Bianca, do you approve? John? Yes. Alice? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I approve as well. So we're done with the minutes and the meeting information. Um, next item on the agenda is the chair's report. I have two things I want to mention. Um, one, uh, you know, I am new in this role of chair. You could all tell me when I go astray on meeting procedures or in any other way. And I am very interested in suggestions and comments for how we can improve the meetings or move forward productively in the coming year. The second thing I wanted to mention is that last year, um, Bianca Taylor was our representative on the Financial Audit Advisory Committee, and she has graciously agreed to continue to serve in that role. Um, she needs to be appointed by the chair of the Light Board, and I am now officially appointing her in that role. So thank you, Bianca. Um, we're going to now go to the first major substantive item, item on the agenda. We move this up because to keep it distinct from the rest of the meeting and um, also to make sure we were doing it at a time certain for the benefit of um, Town Manager LaFleur and others who are on the call. We are going to now focus on the um, search for a permanent director for the light board. Um, the town manager and others are going to talk to us about their plans and the schedule and how they might want to involve the light board in the search. And then we'll have a discussion among the light board members of what are the things we are most hoping will be included in the qualifications for the next light board director? So, um, Town Manager LaFleur, can I turn it over to you? 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Especially good morning to uh, light board members. I appreciate the the introduction on how this made it to the agenda at 7:40 a.m. I think some of the staff that work with me regularly know I'm not a morning person, and some of my staff have already pinged me about um, me being here uh, so early today. So uh, um, I appreciate the time this morning. I did want to introduce two staff who are here with me. Uh, they are on your screen as HR staff, 55 Church Street. Uh, Jess Porter, who is our assistant town manager um, and also our human resources director. And next to her is Kimberly Crum, who is our in-house human resources consultant. Kimberly leads up a lot of the work that we do on compensation and also our recruitment. So they're both here joining me this morning. Uh, we did provide to the board members a draft of the packet for the recruitment. And we're here to walk through that with you today and, and receive some feedback. We're excited that we are ready to move forward with the recruitment for the next director. Uh, but I, I think one thing that I wanted to talk to you about just briefly is the governance of the light plant. Um, and I know that is not specifically listed on your agenda, but I do think that it is part of the recruitment. And I just like to talk about that with you for, for a few minutes. So I'm sure you, you all know, even though you've been, you've all been on the board for uh, varying amounts of time, you all know that under the charter, well, that the town manager serves as the general manager to the light plant and that the town manager appoints a director of the light plant who for all intents and purposes serves as, I, I guess I would liken it to the chief administrative or the chief operating officer for the light plant. So on a day-to-day -day basis, the director of the light plant operates the light plant and, and works with the, with the light board. Um, we have three, three documents that come into play when you when you consider the governance of the light plant or the, the Concord Municipal Light Plant. And that would be the town's charter, which is the legislative, the, the state law specific to Concord that outlines governance for the town of Concord. We have the administrative code, which, which was prepared administratively. Um, it, it's not it's not a law, it's an administrative document that outlines the operation um, and delineates the duties of the general manager, the light plant director, and the light board. And then we have Mass General Law Chapter 40, uh, excuse me, 164, which outlines how light plants, municipal light plants operate in Massachusetts. And I think no matter how long you've been on the light board, you've probably heard the issue that there is some disagreement over governance of the light plant. And this is not new. It's not new to 2024. Uh, it, it for sure goes back to the early 90s. And I think if, if you look at it um, in detail, you will see this, this really goes back to when the charter was adopted and even before the charter was adopted in the 1950s. Um, I have spent quite a bit of time over the last how, however many months or longer trying to understand the governance to make sure that we are operating in the way that we are supposed to, to operate in 2024. What I have found, again, reviewing lots of um, documents, legal opinions, minutes of meetings, notes, is that there is there has been quite a bit of disagreement over time about the general manager, the director of the light plant, the role of the light board. I would like to get this straightened out. Um, I have some thoughts on things 
that need to occur. And I think the, the first is based on legal opinions, I think on both sides, is that it is not appropriate for the town manager to serve as the general manager of the light plant. And you all know, staff, current board members, we have, we have a few, at least a few former board members on here. You all know on a day-to-day -day basis, the town manager is not involved in the operation of the light, the light plant. The town manager as the de facto CEO of, of the town of Concord, um, the involvement with the light plant is, is really as the contracting authority signing off on contracts. But on a day-to-day -day basis, town manager is not currently, has not to the best of my knowledge in the past been involved in the day-to-day -day operation of the light plant. So that is um, that is one change that I think needs to happen. I, I wish we were in a position today before we went forward with the recruitment for the next director to have that issue resolved, but we don't. And there are lots of reasons why it's, it's yet unresolved. Um, but again, I, I have ideas on how to how to make that work. And I guess what I what I'd like to to get from this board today is to gather your support to to work cooperatively to resolve this issue so that for the next uh, so that the next director and the future of the light plant, we don't continue to have this conversation about, about governance. I think probably the best way to resolve it is through some sort of memorandum of understanding. And I, I'd like to be able to work with you in the next several months to, to get that document prepared so that we can resolve this issue and we can move forward and we can stop talking actively, passively, about the governance of the light. And I, I appreciate you hearing me out on that because I, I think it's it's important um, in I would say in most in most communities, the town manager does not serve as the general manager. the the general manager is or is our director of, of the light plant. So we are, because we are in this position, we are moving forward with the recruitment for a director, but we've, to the best of our ability, made uh, reference in the recruitment materials to this governance issue that we would like to resolve. Um, maybe I would take a pause here for a moment and see if there are any questions and high level mm -hmm. questions. Yeah, well, this issue has certainly come up um, at light board meetings, and my suspicion is the light board will um, support you wholeheartedly in working to resolve this. But let's see if there are any questions and comments from other board members. Brian. Uh, yeah, so, Carrie, um, this is something that... Uh, has come up many times, as you said, in the past. And usually it requires uh, people to have a, a deeper understanding of the context uh, for the governance to really be understood and, and to be, have a discussion. Um, so I would ask that you help the board understand what you what how the governance is working now and how you think it will change um, and really understand who, what which group, the director, the general manager, the town manager, and the light board, in what cases do they have authority in, to make decisions? Uh, because that has, you're right, it's been very muddy. Um, the only thing clear was, you know, the light board is setting rates, but as you said, contracts are, require the town manager, but really you receive a contract and you're not in the day to day. So you don't know the context of that contract. Uh, so it, it's, it's difficult for you to, uh, you just signing what you're told to sign rather than having intimate knowledge as the director does about the contracts and so forth. So this is a great update, um, for the governance. Um, but I do ask that we, uh, we, we look at governance as a whole topic and kind of get into it. I, I certainly agree with that. There are just volumes and volumes of paperwork 
on this. Um, and I understand that, that everybody on this call has probably has a different level of understanding of, of what has happened over time. And I think this issue has to be looked at. You know, you can't just look at the state law and say that that is the only thing that applies. You can't just look at case law and say that is the only thing that applies. You have to look at everything in totality, including with the town's charter, which which plays a role here. Um, and it is a very confusing topic. And again, there have been, um, we have conflicting, somewhat conflicting legal opinions. And I think most importantly, we've had a lot of, a lot of um, well-intentioned, well-respected town residents who have been members of the light board, the select board, or you know, over a very long time, looking at this issue in in one way or another, and and I guess it appears not being able to come to an agreement, and so we need to understand why why this issue remains outstanding. You know, what what were the things that that prevented some sort of resolution to it? Any time this this was raised. Um. I, I, Wait, let me go on to Bianca. Sure. I'll... Hi. Um, so I have a question. It may be, I don't know if it's the right time to ask, um, but why would it be a memor uh, memorandum of understanding and not just a change in the administrative code and a change in title? Um, so I will, Bianca, I'll give you a very high level overview of that. And um, it may be as we get further into this with legal experts that, that there's a different recommendation. Um, there certainly could be a change in the charter. That, that would resolve it. Um, that the, the charter, again, is uh, legislation that was adopted by the mass legislature. It's specific to the governance of the town of Concord. So there is a process for that. That would resolve it. A change to the administrative code may resolve the issue while the, the five of you, I, I'm working with the same, the same five of you, the same light director, the same town manager, but the administrative code is an administrative document. It was drafted, <clears throat> as I understand it, by a former town manager to outline or to, to delineate roles and responsibilities, but it, it, it wasn't approved by town meeting, for instance. It's, it's not state legislation. It's not state law. So it's, it's not something that holds a ton of weight. I see Michael Hale has his hand raised, so I am going to defer to, to Michael for further response. You know, uh, thank you. I um, you know, have a lot of thoughts on this, and like Carrie, I've read a lot of the documents that she's provided me and legal opinions, and I've been through this in other communities as well, and it's always the case where the municipal attorney differs somewhat from the municipal light plant attorney in terms of interpretation on whether or not a charter has governance over 164 or 164 takes precedence over a charter. It's muddied a little further in Concord and in Shrewsbury from where I worked because the, the respective charters were implemented around the same time in the 50s and they are actual acts of the legislature. Uh, they are in and of themselves their own law. Um, so many charters are just uh, uh, approved locally, uh, but aren't officially an act of the legislature. So that muddies it a little bit more in that you have two state laws and there is uh, some conflict uh, in as to which one governs that could probably only be um, resolved by some type of case. Uh, there is no case law to date. I do, do not suggest that that is the solution. That is probably the last thing that you would want to do. Um, one thought I have is that 
you know, well, I actually have a couple thoughts. One, the position of director has the ability to adversely impact the candidate pool for the recruitment of what many um, established uh, candidates would want the title of general manager and some additional responsibilities that go along with that. So that's one concern. However, that issue is not going to be resolved um, immediately uh, unless miracles happen. So I agree with Carrie on how she's proceeding. She explained to me that there, we, we need to take a, a parallel path. Uh, and that makes sense to me. One suggestion I have, and by um, no means is it the only way to do this, is I would be willing to sit on a working group comprised of Kerry, uh, myself, and a representative from both the select board and the light board to see if we can iron this out and, and come up with uh, a memorandum of understanding that may, you know, have a five year sunset or, you know, see how it works. And then step two would, be, if it works well, step two might be to incorporate changes um, to the um, charter for the community, which would require a town meeting vote and then uh, be sent to the legislature for their enactment. They don't typically um, turn down charter amendments um, at the legislature. It's just a time consuming process. So I, I think we should have a subcommittee and try and flush out these differences and come out, come up with um, a, for the lack of a better term, a, a MOU. Thank you, Michael. Brian. Um, yeah, I, I love the idea of establishing a working group because it does require uh, a small group of people to become very knowledgeable on this. Um, I the the last question I wanted to ask or request uh, was that as we go through this process, we should also look at uh, whether the light board itself should be appointed or elected. Uh, Concord, we've I don't feel there's anything wrong with the way Concord is is working. I think we all get along. I think we have done a great job in governing this this entity uh, but we are unusual in the fact that we're appointed um, as a board so I, I'm not requesting that we change to an elected board but I, I would like to see some kind of evaluation um, of of that choice so that we can think about that while we think about the governance structure any other comments on the governance issue before we get on to what will be the main focus of our discussion here. Thank you. Well, in any case, um, Carrie, you know, you certainly heard, I think, willingness on the part of the board to um, collaborate with you on working to resolve this matter and we could figure out the best way to set up a subcommittee or something else to work on it, but we'll leave it to you to decide the pace at which we move on that. Okay, hey, terrific. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and, and I know the organization as a whole appreciates the the interest in in getting this issue addressed because it, it definitely uh, it definitely impacts it, it does have an impact on on the organization. So in terms of, of the recruitment again we've prepared some materials, they are included in your packet. There is a copy of a draft of the um, the profile, the position profile. And it it is our, follows our, I guess, our new standard for position profiles for, for positions of this stature within, within the organization. Uh, we did incorporate the feedback that we received from Jason on behalf of the management team at the light plant. And, and I think you probably saw that as well. So Jason, this is at this point, this is probably three months ago or so that, that Jason worked with, with the management team at the light plant to gather feedback. 
on their thoughts on the next director. So we did incorporate, use that and break that into the profile that we put together. Um, there is one highlighted section on the second page of, of the recruitment that talks about, um, and it does say con the, the Concord Select Board establishes annual goals and objectives uh, following guiding principles. And I did highlight that because uh, Michael and I had the opportunity to review that had some discussion about select board goals and, and how they may may or may not impact the goals of the light plan. These here are, as, as they're noted, guiding principles of, of, of the community that were prepared by the select board, but the, the select board would ask that any goals that any board or committee or department prepares are following these these guiding principles. So I thought it was in, appropriate to in, include in the recruitment materials. Uh, we've also included a proposed timetable, which I'm sure is longer than anybody would like to see, but this is a process. There are several panel interviews that are proposed as a part of this process. And it's going to take this long to, to, to move through the process. We've also in, included the most recent position description for the director of the light. Um, I, I don't know either Jess or Kimberly, if there is anything specific you would like to mention about the recruitment or if we should just open it up for, for feedback. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I would just highlight for you on the third page of the, um, the um, first document under Director of Concord Municipal Light Plant Position. Um, that last sentence is where we've highlighted uh, the structure of the role is under review, and it's possible that the role will become that of general manager. And so uh, in keeping with your earlier conversation, I wanted to point that out. But otherwise, we just want to thank the management team and Jason and his interim role for all the information that assisted us in putting this together. Great. So I know um, light board members only received this yesterday, so you may not have had um, extensive time to review it, but what questions or comments do you have on these documents? And let's leave this aside from the question of what we as a light board feel are qualities we're most looking for in a new light board director, but more focus on any questions or comments on the process or on the documents. Bianca. Thanks, Warren. Um, so the the question that I have, and it, 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 again, it may be a, a longer question, probably involved with the, the perhaps uh, part of the subcommittee um, that uh, you're trying to establish, but how does this um, role, does it have, are, are the salaries overall of the light plant also going to be addressed? And does the salary range of the of the director, is that commensurate with that of a general manager? Um, will that be an issue? Um, and, you know, how does it flow from there? Um, are these issues that you think will need to be addressed now or later, or how does that work? I, I'll i attempt an answer, but I'm happy to, to take uh, support from 55 Church Street on this. Uh, the, the town of, of Concord in, has a new class and comp plan. You, you may be aware that at the 2023 annual town meeting, town meeting was asked to approve a new class and comp plan that covered all non-union employees, including the light. We actually, our, our plan has two parts. 
um, Part B is specific to the light plant. The town worked with an outside consultant to do an extensive review of its classification and compensation plan. The last time this was done was in the early 2000s. Uh, we, we pulled municipal comps. Uh, we had we had our general comps for, for non-union positions. We had a specific comp group for the light plant positions, looking at communities that also had light plants. We targeted all of our positions in that plan. The, the salary ranges have a 40% spread. The minimum is targeted at the 85th percentile of market. The midpoint is, is targeted at about 100%. It's probably slightly over. And then the top of the top of the range is targeted at 100 and the 120th percentile. Now this this is two years ago, uh, but we we were advised by the group that we worked with that these ranges should hold for a period of five years. Uh, I I can tell you I hear on a very regular basis. Um, people poking holes at these ranges at specific salaries. Uh, so is, is this the, this is the full range that we have approved for this position. Is it, is it gonna get the job done? I don't know. The salaries for municipal light plants are very high and it seems like there is continuous movement on a more than annual basis. It's it's very difficult from from my view to to keep current on these particular salaries, but it's it's what I have approved by town meeting. I I don't um, I don't necessarily have the flexibility to do something other than than what's posted here. But so it, I, 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 go on. Another thing, because I think Bianca, you asked, are we going to be looking at at light plant salaries in general? Um, right. And I, I, I can't, I, I can't tell you he, right here that we are going to look at the ranges. I can't tell you what the timetable is that we're going to look at the ranges because we did just go through this study. That doesn't mean we won't look at individual salaries and placement within the ranges, but I, I don't know um, just yet when we would be looking at the ranges in total next time. Thank you, Alice. You're on next. Right. Um, so I think I appreciate Bianca's comments because they were the same that I was thinking. I am concerned having been on the life plant now for five years that our salaries are always difficult. Um, for every position we've ever hired for, um, which is part of the problem with managing our light plant is that we offer extremely low salaries all the way through the department. So uh, although I appreciate the most recent study, um, if we bring somebody in, not at the low point, but at the 100% mark, there's very little growth potential remaining in that position that would have somebody committed to staying at the light plant. And I think longevity is a is a value to us in a lot of ways because it's a very complicated organization to manage. And I'd hate to be out here in four years from now renegotiating the salary or um, going out to start again to find somebody new, whoever comes in. So my worry is that um, municipal salaries are lower than, than salaries across the board in other um, domains, but... I don't think that we should necessarily keep ours that low, that we can't bring in the highest quality person we can to meet the extraordinarily high expectations of the citizens of Concord. So that's that's my worry. I understand that that's what we have to work with, Kerry, um, because these are this is what's been approved, and it was something that happened recently at town meeting, but it's still not the most current on salary representation. And we know that COVID has totally changed the expectations and salary that are that. Um, and the candidates are expecting to be able to do an ever complicated position or job in, in our municipality. Those are my thoughts. So I, I appreciate 
that it doesn't end here with one salary study completed a couple of years ago when we look across the board at all of the salaries at the light plant. So that's my worry. And I share it with Bianca. And thank you for bringing it up, Bianca. Thank you. Brian. Um, we did just receive these documents uh, a day ago, and I've only been able to kind of skim through um, these documents. I, I just saw on the, I guess it's the position itself, um, Director of Concord Municipal Light Plant, um, down in the third bu bullet under job, uh, essential job functions, it says DPI regulations in the second bullet, uh, and that should be DPU, uh, Department of Public Utilities. Uh, so I want to have time to kind of comb through and find some of those because any candidate that would be doing this position uh, would know that's an error and uh, I'd like to to kind of call some of those out before they get published. That raises, thank you, Brian, that raises a useful question is, when do you intend to publish these? Because we can give light board members until that time to submit any corrections or edits. Yeah, so we we are looking targeting sometime next week. Um, I I believe we have June eighteenth, which is Tuesday. We certainly could move that to the nineteenth to give this the board about a week to. Good. And if anybody finds any um, either typos or other things that need to be addressed, who should we address the comments to. Why don't you send them to me and I'll make sure they, they get to over to HR. I, I just like to see what the, the comments are. Okay, sounds good. Um, and if I could, Michael. Uh, I only wanna go after all the light board members. No so one else just... has their hands up, so. I, I would just like to add two issues, which I think are important that need to be included. And one is the um, strategic plan and working with the light board to update the strategic plan and some experience in dealing with strategic planning, because that's a, a fairly significant issue here. And the other is the implement, you know, projects there. It mentions projects that are ongoing in the uh, in, in install implementation of a SCADA system, uh, I think is um, should be included. Good, thank you. Any other comments on the process or on the documents? Well. Thank you. I want to then turn to the board. Uh, before we have any candidates on the table who've applied before the process starts, it would be good for us collectively to have some discussion about what we think is most important in the next director and see if we have agreement on that or not. Um, does anybody on the light board want to point out what you think is important to look for in the next director? Brian. Um, I think what's important with the, the next director is we need someone who is progressive leaning. In other words, we're willing to uh, make changes, um, but also has the ability to say no. Um, you know, uh, this is this is a complicated business in the sense that there is a uh, traditional way of selling a product, which is this centralized grid where we have consumers and we sell a product to those consumers. That is changing to a business model, which is more like 
um, an exchange of energy where we provide product as electrons, but we also now have customers that are providing uh, electrons. So we're now changing our rates, changing how um, how we bill for things such that we can ensure the institution uh, is collecting to be there as this exchange of, of energy, uh, but we're not necessarily a supplier only of electricity. So that's a, that's a transition the whole industry is going through um, and we need someone who can manage that path in doing large projects that have value. When people ask for some big projects that may sound great and make us feel good, but might not have good uh, financial value, they need to be able to say, that's a great idea, but no, we need to focus on the core uh, business. So that's a that's my thoughts on, on, on the type of person that I think we should should be hiring. Thank you. Bianca. Yeah, so um, I think that the, you know, overall, um, I, I would want to see someone with strong leadership and communication skills, particularly communication, excellent communication with the board and excellent communication with the light plant staff itself, which is something that was clearly lacking previously. And I think we can, you know, see the change that has, has been, it's been transformative um, with Jason as the interim director. Um, so yeah, just uh, however, and in terms of the leadership skills, I won't go into defining what that is. I think, you know, everyone, we, we can, we can uh, recognize it when we see it. <laughs> um, that's it. That's just my input. Good. And Alice. So I think this is a great laundry list and I wouldn't do make too many changes to it. But I, the thing I feel pretty strongly about is the organ, the, the um, ordering of all of these skills and attributes that we're looking for. Um, uh, I, if we're trying to attract somebody, I think we need to put our strongest foot forward. An advanced degree is not, in my high, in my frame of reference, the most critical item for this new person to have, but extra, extraordinary leadership skills is. So I would re, I would look at that very long laundry list of the ideal candidate and prioritize the things that are most important for this transition period of changing our light board into a much more progressive organization and take out or put down lower in that list the items that are like writing grants is not probably the most critical part of this job, that they have a lot of other more important day-to-day -day operational and leadership ideas that need to be put forward. So that's, so I don't want to get into nitty gritty, but you get the concept of what I'm looking at in, in reviewing this document. Great, thank you. And John? It's hard to go forth with this group. Um, I, I very much agree with uh, the, some of the ideas that have been put forward, uh, you know, with Bianca in terms of communication, um, and it's it's outlined in the job description. I, I think that one thing that's essential is the ability to to communicate in reasonably simple terms complex concepts. You know, that really is um, kind of the essence. I think, and you know, we we saw this attribute uh, displayed by Jason recently in terms of the, the town meeting, um, and then. You know, to go back to Brian's comment, I, I might frame it a little more uh, positively. Uh, I, I did like the point in terms of the ability to say no, but I think it's the technical understanding and financial understanding to be able to kind of evaluate issues and to uh, establish, you know, the best interests of customers, um, recognizing kind of the uh, complexity of the industry. Good. And does, thank you, John. And does anybody on the light board disagree with any of the comments that your fellow light board members have made? Or can we take this collective group of comments as our sort of consensus view of what's needed? It seems like. I, I feel we could do this as a consensus. I didn't hear any you know, corrections or clarifications. And I, I agree with John's clarification of my statement. I think that's a good spin on it. Yeah. Good. And I'll just 
raise one other thing back on the communications front, which Bianca and John have both talked about. Uh, we're talking about a light plant and an electricity system that's going to be going through a period of transition. We're going to be moving towards time of use rates. We're making other significant changes to the system. It really does need to be somebody who can explain those things in terms that citizens of Concord who have not been following the, all the details of light plant management can understand and feel comfortable that um, the light plant is being managed well and there's an understanding of what these changes mean. Any other comments anybody wants to make about the process, about the new director? Well, thank you all for your input here. Um, thanks for all the folks from um, the town manager and town side who come to this part of the meeting. We could move on to our next agenda item, which will be the um, director's report. Thank you, Warren. Um, first, I just want to thank the operations uh, teams and the engineering teams for their dedication and quick responses to some of the outages that we've had since our last meeting. There was an outage on uh, Mother's Day due to a failed recloser. There was uh, two outages uh, just on June 1st, one on Oxbow due to a pole strike, and then the other 300 Baker Ave due to some uh, underground conductors. And these teams were there on site for uh, sometimes very long days working with uh, stakeholders that had their own set of difficult problems to address. So um, they just did a fantastic job at getting the power on quickly. We heard some good feedback from residents that were um, pleased and understanding of challenging situations that they work in. So I wanted to thank those folks. Um, at the end of May, I attended uh, an E&E &E customer forum where we got a legislative update from um, State Senator Brad Jones. He's the minority leader in the State Senate and um, gave a really good update on some of the pending legislation relative to light plants and um, some energy packages and some stimulus bills that are out there. There was a lot of really helpful uh, conversations about battery projects, about energy pricing and contracts, and I just found it really uh, valuable and informative. Uh, I also attended a webinar on protecting the grid. Um, yeah, I think this was put on by APPA and uh, some of the physical threats that we face. I wanted to just mention um, that we I did talk about NetWatch before, which is the, the company that will be actively monitoring our surveillance cameras at the substations. And uh, we'll have two-way communication with anybody who um, comes near them. That project is underway and the folks are on site. Uh, I thank Joe and his team for being so patient with them and trying to accommodate their requests. Uh, they hopefully will be done in the next week or two with that and we'll have we'll be onboarded and set up. And then maybe by the end of the month or early July, we'll have that uh, complete. Um, Let's see, I have asked uh, Laura and her team to pull together some data on um, our rebate programs. And one thing that I thought would be really telling was to see if we could understand how much value we're getting in terms of net carbon reduction on each of these programs. So we have a, a wide array of programs ranging from you know EV chargers, EV you know, vehicles, um, to heat pump programs, weatherization, uh, energy efficiency. And I think that we have, you know, kind of goals with these programs more than just kind of matching mass saves. And I think that it's important to evaluate those and understand uh, what kind of impact are they having on the environment? What kind of impact do they have on the system? What kind of impact do they have on rates uh, for, you know, how accessible are they? And, you know, we, we don't have to simply follow mass saves. We can do more in some areas, less in other areas. And I think having that information will allow us to have a, an educated conversation about the efficacy of those programs. So she's done a great job of getting some preliminary information. It's hard because you really have to make a lot of assumptions because one thing that does a lot of good in one person's house might not do very much good in another person's house. So we're really having to try to take away the outliers and understand how these systems are being used and what the, what the impact on each dollar is. So um, I'd be excited to present some of this data in, at a future meeting to the board. 
Uh, we don't have the report on the landfill slope yet, but we're hoping that TRC will have that back to us soon. This would be both feasibility and the um, a rough cost estimate on what the impact would be. Regarding advanced metering, Carol and her team and all the folks that support her uh, are doing a fantastic job. So we've, we're crossing probably today the two thirds threshold for meters installed with an estimated completion date of October 15th for residential meters. And then we'll be focusing on commercial meters after that. And hopefully too, by that time, we'll be done with all those road control relays that were um, installed for those ETS units and, and some of the other um, load uh, managed customers that we have. Um, it, it was super helpful in the outages in June that both of them were in territories where we had advanced meters. So it was fantastic to see in real time the precise number of customers that are out. The current outage map does make a lot of assumptions because if it sees so many customers down on a particular circuit, it might assume that the whole circuit is down and mark 800 customers out. But um, we knew that, we always knew that that number was not indicative of the actual number of customers out. But now we can definitively see in real time, you know, who is out, who is not. And that's just fantastic for troubleshooting because a lot of times in the field, they might replace a transformer or a power protection device and, and assume that that has restored power to all the customers. But now we'll know, you know, almost instantly to see like, yep, they've all come back online. Um, so uh, Joe and his team have done a great job with those level three chargers at the ride out. Uh, so we now have the board's voted rate on both units. Uh, you can use either a, a flow or another approved app to get that or just scan a QR code right on the unit and uh, you'll be able to get those approved rates, which are time of use per kilowatt hour. And um, we got good news from the state. They were able to move us into a different funding source for that EVIP grant, which means that we will get the full um, amount allocated to us. We were kind of worried because we bought the things before one fiscal year started and then the project ended in a different fiscal year and the state was concerned that maybe only one bucket of money that we spent, which was still pretty close to the, the grand maximum, but we might have missed out on some dollars. But luckily, we've been moved to a, a different funding source. So we're going to get the full amount where the last pieces are, I believe we need a sign on the street and then also the height and accessibility of the, the handles and the, the charger. So we just need to make sure all that's compliant per the grant rules um, and hopefully soon we'll have that done. I wanted to mention that uh, second class line worker Matt McNamara participated in NEPA's apprentice rodeo uh, last week and this is a, it's a friendly competition but really an educational process where um, in this case apprentice line workers were, were sort of judged and monitored on a series of skills to change out equipment or do rescue at the top of poles without buckets and um, you know we have some we had some experienced guys, Rich and um, Matt, who were there as judges. And you know uh, the judges in this case, when when a line worker starts, they have 100 points, and they are docked points for any doing anything incorrectly or doing something that's unsafe, or maybe dropping some equipment or tools on the ground. And then um, they are time for the rescue because if somebody does get um, electrocuted or incapacitated at the top of a pole, you've got only so many seconds to get them down safely. So. Um, I found that really interesting, and I thank Joe and all the folks that were out there, too, to support our, our people. Uh, Matt should be done with his um, apprentice training, which is, I think, four years uh, at the end of this year. So um, he did a great job. Um, we have received the proposal for the SCADA system. Um, this We've had many, many talks with, with uh, SEL, this vendor, who does a lot of our power protection devices in town. And um, they are, uh, the team is going over this very carefully. We will be working with two other vendors uh, in addition to whoever manufactures the devices to get this installed, tested, verified, and make sure that it works with how our system has been designed. So this process will take a little bit, but um, I'm gonna be working on the procurement angle to see what we can do to expedite this so that when they are ready to move forward, that we'll be ready to actually you know, make a purchase the lead times have gotten a little bit better with some of the equipment, so that's good. Uh, we won't really know until we place the order, but uh, everything is, is going along well with that project. Um, I've been working internally with HR, external recruiters, Joe, Mike, and others to uh, try to refocus on those vacant line worker positions. I'll just remind everybody that we have five line workers today, which is really kind of considered a full crew, one full crew. Uh, the goal is to have two full crews. And you know, depending on the level and experience of the folks that we have, that could be anywhere between eight and 10 people, ideally. 
And, um, you know, when we have a, a busy summer where people have vacation plans and um, we have, you know, heat waves, we have um, high winds or, you know, early hurricane season, uh, it can be really challenging to make sure that we have enough people on hand and nearby that if we had a big outage that we'd be able to take care of that. And I know that it stresses out those guys on a daily basis and it stresses me out. So we're trying to do what we can to um, change the recruitment plan and package that we're presenting for what this job is and make sure that we address some of these foundational issues that have uh, sort of come to the surface in previous recruitments that have maybe failed or, or um, you know, only been very short lasting. Um, and then I just want to thank the board members and anybody else who attended the Climate Tech um, Conference in Boston. I, unfortunately, I had something come up that I had to be in the office for that day, so I did not get to go, but I'd love to hear if anybody had any um, things of note from that. And that concludes my update. No, oh, Warren, you're muted. Sorry. I assume you called up, Brian. Is that, yes, you could read my lips. <laughs> Fine. Um, yeah, so um, two things. I'll start with the second one first. Um, I attended the the climate tech conference. Um, it was really kind of a, a state led um, rah rah session for uh, state programs related to climate and uh, and trying to attract climate focused businesses to Massachusetts. Um, one of the the talks really excited me. Uh, there is a device called Sense, uh, and there's other devices like this. They're consumer level devices that allow the average homeowner or customer to see what devices are consuming the electricity they're paying for every month, rather than just seeing their bill and guessing. This is a, what I've always referred to as energy wise customers. If If you, I had a a person, a customer come to me and was getting a $4,000 bill and they didn't know why as a single family home that they were paying so much for electricity. And it took a hunt around their house to find that they had a resistance wire on their roof that was on continuously. And that was what was consuming all the, the electricity. It was for icicles and ice dams. Uh, it was midsummer. So, but if someone is as a customer is able to see what devices are consuming the electricity, they're more able to control the the amount that they're paying um, by more efficiently operating those devices. Um, but the reason that I mention Sense and other products like it is that uh, it's now being incorporated into the next generation of smart meters. Now we're in the middle of our deployment of smart meters, so we've kind of just missed this boat. Uh, but as we look to swap out meters in the future, um, it might be a good idea to really in incorporate this technology because the consumer can learn a lot of information, but also the utility. If, if it's integrated with the meter, we can learn a lot of information about how the electricity is being consumed and, and kind of better inform our, our rebate programs and other things. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is uh, you're going to evaluate the uh, rebate programs and not only the financial value that they return, uh, but also the carbon impact. The carbon impact can get very wonky. Um, I know that years ago, this is probably six, seven years ago, Janicetti had brought to the board a great way to look at these programs that incorporated the social value um aspects uh you know reduced air pollution kind of value that these the, the clean energy provides so um i'd ask that we kind of go back to jan and see if she can find that evaluation document um from way back when or something equivalent and and use kind of a existing standard to kind of help us evaluate these programs thank you brian any other questions or comments from the board thank Let's go on to the broadband update. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick ones today. Um, we are working with a new fiber company to get additional bandwidth for our fiber business. We currently have three ISPs. Um, we've got two 10 gig circuits and a one gig circuit. But the second 10 gig has not been upgraded yet because we're waiting for additional fiber um, and to be proofed and um, pulled in one area. But 
Um, this would be a, a, a company that would replace the one gig. It would be nearly the same price as the one gig. And uh, it would be burstable, which would mean that if heavy demand set in, it could go up to 100 gigs for this circuit. So we'd pay for 10. And then if anything went above that, we, we could meet that demand. Um, we did have a, a circuit go down recently. It ended up coming back before there was heavy demand, but it would have been really nice to have something that could expand beyond the provision speed. So this would be a great um, opportunity for us. And I thank Dale for kind of investigating this and uh, working with the company. Then um, we continue to work on the um, Massachusetts Residential Retrofit Program. This is a grant opportunity where we would get 100% of costs for extending fiber and internet access to low-income housing areas. And we have two places in Concord that are eligible. And these are the Peter Bulkley uh, Terrace and the uh, Everett Gardens. So um, we've got an estimate uh, from a, a company that can do everything, can do the trenching, the fiber, the splicing, the connection points. And, uh, you know, it's well over $300,000, but they failed to use prevailing wage in the first quote. So they're adjusting that. So this could be, um, you know, $400,000 basically of infrastructure that would allow us to connect maybe somewhere between 50 and 100 customers but to give them access to this, you know, badly needed utility. So um, the first round, a, a tranche of, of, of grant funding did not include Concord for its eligibility, but they are planning to do more and more. They just wanted to start uh, kind of closer in some of the big cities in the, uh, the lower income areas. So uh, we are, we continue to get ready. We'll have those quotes, you know, on hand so that as soon as this um, is released for our area, we can apply. And um, we're, we've been getting creative with solutions to uh, come up with common Wi-Fi uh, for certain areas and uh, and also accommodation of individual uh, ONTs or customer accounts. And then I want to thank uh, Dale, Carol, Donna, and everybody uh, who's been working on the $20 a month credit that was approved by the board. Um, they figured out kind of the administrative backend work, and now we're working on identifying uh, the customers and then setting up the bill print uh, for that a miscellaneous charge. So basically, uh, before something can go through, it, there has to be accommodations on the bill for that charge to appear. And that's something we have to work with our billing vendor on getting set up. So once that's done, we've already got the customers identified. We're working on some messaging, so we'll let them know. We'll also let the folks who are part of the, the electric rate assistance program who are not currently broadband customers know about the uh, program and then we'll be you know updating the website and all of our order forms and everything to refer to this it does seem like other isps are continuing um, some form of credit uh, after the afford affordable connectivity program uh, expired so uh, that's all i've got for my broadband update thank you jason any comments or questions very good thank you let's move on to the next agenda item which is the middle school project. And um, this is in great part to give us all an update on where things stand. But I'm also hoping at the end of it, the board will be willing to go on the record. We don't need a motion, but go on the record as supporting flexibility and how the staff proceeds on this project going forward because I think um, we're going to need to take flexible approaches to get this thing done and done well. So, Jason. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to mention this is a huge team effort with Michael, Laura, um, Joe, Jeff, Mike, Matt, Mary, and many other people that I didn't mention who are helping with this project. Um, so I'd like to thank them for all their help. I do want to mention that uh, after the ZBA variance was granted, there's a 20-day waiting period, appeal period, and that has expired. So we should be getting our signed um, order any day now from their administrative staff. Um, so there are three main areas of this project. There's the canopy solar, there's the rooftop solar, and there's the battery storage. Um, you would like to have thought that coordinating this during the construction of the school would have made all of these projects much easier, but in fact, the opposite has been true because of the difficulty we've had dealing with the contractors on site. 
Um, so for the canopy solar, there's actually two components, right? There's the footings and the foundation, and then there's the canopies themselves. The footings, because of the sandy soil in this building location, the footings are 48 inches in diameter and between 17 and 23 feet deep. So these are extremely huge footings for these he heavy canopies. Um, and that work that we were going to do, we had um, SDA had helped us get rough estimates for that. And when we did the pricing for this way back when, um, we had an anticipated cost for, for some of these uh, components that led to the presentation at town meeting um, that, you know, was was overwhelmingly approved. So um, for the rooftop, I'll just mention the architects uh, had asked us not to penetrate the membrane on the roof because they had concerns about a brand new roof and then us, you know, basically drilling holes through it, um, being concerned about the, the longevity. So we had looked at and found alternatives that include sort of a chemical welding of the racking structure to the roof membrane without actually having to penetrate it. And there's a couple other technologies uh, using a ballast to hold it down. And so that has always been the plan for that. And then regarding the battery storage, that has kind of fluctuated. There was talks of a one by four, uh, and now our current plan is a two megawatt by four megawatt hour uh, battery there. And we've been designing our switchboard to accommodate the canopies, the rooftop, the battery, and take all of these inputs and, and put the power where it needs to go so that it can be accessed by the school, by the town. Uh, and remember, this is a CMLP and ratepayer-led initiative, not a school initiative. So the plan for some time has been to bid these as separate projects. And um, you know the people that have battery storage um, experience might not necessarily be the same people that have solar storage. So there was kind of always a separation between those two and it might be the same vendor and that would be great, but we wanted to ask for some flexibility on that and also make sure we got the best, um, the best pricing. So um, CTA is the school's general contractor and they've got many subcontractors working on the site right now. Um, since they were already a qualified bidder, we did reach out to them and, and said, hey, since you're doing construction on the site, can you get a, a sub bid for the foundations so that this can be done in conjunction with the building project that's going on? So they took them a little while to find somebody that would give them a quote. But what came back was uh, $1.2 million for the foundations just themselves, and then a total cost of $2.17 million for that that work plus any related project management spoils management you know having to move things around um, shifting their schedule uh, so this cost is somewhere between two and three times what was estimated uh, by sda and the, and the people that they got we have mary also on our team who's got extensive construction experience and she talked to some people who do foundations and footings uh, and caissons and they thought that the number was between two and three times high sda talk to some other people, and we know that this is very high. And again, there could be many reasons why it's it's uh, their plan to do this. Sometimes contractors bid low and then expect to make things up in change orders. Sometimes there are schedule delays and they need a kind of a scapegoat for that. But for all these reasons and more, it's very concerning for us to move forward with this uh, at this cost number one, which could could you know drastically change the estimated cost and the and the cost per kilowatt of these projects, uh, and then also the the potential schedule impacts. Even if we did this work, they couldn't guarantee it wouldn't affect their schedule in other ways, which would put us liable for any delays or cost overruns in other areas. So we've told them that we would not like to move forward with CTA procuring this portion of the project. And that we would work with the schools and the and the hill, who is the project manager for the whole project, to see if there's a way that, um, you know, maybe if the binder is down and we can do the foundations, and then we can remove the uh, top coat of the pavement from the project, and then we could take that on and do that, you know, when we do the canopies later. But what we've been doing is we've been working with SMMA, the architect, to make sure that we have the proper drainage for all these canopies because they need to tie into the existing site drainage. So we're moving forward with that. We're moving forward with Griffin and, and others to make sure we have the conduit to all the canopy locations so that we can add the uh, electrical cable back, the conductors back to um, the switchboard and the vault that we have designed. Moving forward with the vault and the capacity to tie in all of these, um, these uh, canopies. But I do think that when we bid this out, you know, our recommendation is to bid this as a rooftop plus an ad alternate with the canopy so that 
one company could bid on both, but we could then evaluate the actual cost of the canopies and determine if it's still in the ratepayer's best interest for what they're getting. Now, I think the rooftop was roughly 500 something kilowatts. The canopies were roughly 700. So there is a substantial amount of uh, solar in those canopies, and we don't want to lose that, you know, but um, where we're at at this point, I think that we're we're trying to, as Warren mentioned, maintain flexibility with the project so that we're not beholden to a particular timeline. We've heard from many folks who've done solar projects with schools that, that they said under no circumstances should you be putting rooftop solar within the first few months or even year of that building going live. A, a roof problem could be in the tens of thousands of dollars or more to fix if it's a structural issue. And putting that stuff on at the outset could void some of the one-year warranties that people get in, I think it was Wakefield, Laura was talking to the folks and they deliberately waited a period of time and sure enough, they had a roof issue and it was very costly to repair, but it was all on the original you know, roofing contractor. Now, I don't think we're advocating to wait a full year before we do that, but we do think it makes sense to wait until the membrane is com completely done. We've gone through a little bit of weather to make sure that there's not any major issues before we do that. Again, gluing, or adhering or welding this to the surface is gonna be less impactful than drilling, but still there could be underlying issues with some of the HVAC or other materials that they're putting up on the roof that could cause problems that won't turn up until some time has gone by. And then in terms of CTA being on site and being kind of the general contractor there, it is helpful for us to have flexibility to be, say, this is what we want, but we don't have to do that. Cause if we have to do it, they know that they have, you know, they're gonna charge us a rate that is commensurate with us having no other choice. So by having the choice and flexibility, we're able to try to get all three of these things done uh, per the voters request in a timely manner, but with some flexibility and kind of the arrangement in which thing comes first. Um, you know, we are talking to SDA about um, microgrid controllers. We're talking uh, to Joe and his team uh, and maybe looking at SEL. We've already seen the demo for the Eden microgrid controller, which also seems like it would fit Kind of in this type of environment, we're looking at battery storage providers and we're um, talking to SDA about uh, helping us with the bid documents. Uh, we're going to be reaching out to Belmont, which recently put uh, solar panels on their high school and had an extensive bid process there. We're trying to document all of our concerns and our timelines and our requirements that we have so that they are in the document and they don't it doesn't result in change orders or kind of time overruns because we didn't think of something. So that's in the phase that we're at. Mary is kind of acting as the OPM on this uh, project, which is required by law following chapter 149. And there's even kind of debate about the procurement method. So council advises that if we were getting a battery storage unit and we were getting canopies at this site and CMLP is owning it, we could follow chapter 164 for procurement. So we could basically advertise for a week and we can follow um, the guidelines there and choose the vendor that we think is going to be the best and the safest for the ratepayers. Um, unfortunately, because we're touching a, a municipal building, we're going to have to go through Chapter 149. We have reached out uh, to council, again, a different uh, council that we have, just to clarify how these projects are split up to understand if there is some advantage to doing it separately or doing it together and um, how we can try to you know, maximize the, uh, the benefit to, to following the process that's going to be most beneficial to the ratepayers. So um, that's still kind of pending. Um, we are looking at um, issues with the elective pay, which would be our ability to claim the uh, Inflation Reduction Act credits. Um, we're not eligible to receive the same that a private company would be, but there are domestic content requirements and other requirements that we need to meet to maximize those credits. So we have retained Baker Tilly. We've got a PO and an agreement with them. We're scheduling a kickoff very soon. And we'll be working with them to incorporate their feedback and recommendations into the bid process so that we can specify requirements that will end up getting us the highest credit uh, possible. And then we're also looking at, you know, things that help us in a wider um, way, like curtailment and ability to, uh, you know, dispatch the battery or do peak shaving and see how we can bake some of those things into this so that we don't have to kind of okay, we've got it up and running. Well, now we need to think about how, how does this integrate in the, the wider grid or how do we do this or how do we do that? So we're trying to incorporate all that in there, which means it's taking more time, but it's also going to result in hopefully, a, you know, we, we do this once and we're done. Um, so in summary, where we are, we're doing everything that we can to be ready for the canopies. 
Um, we are looking at um, you know, when we bid out the canopies, there will be it will include the foundation work. Um, we're having that kickoff with Baker Tilly. We met with SDA yesterday. We were in constant communication with them to get a strategic and technical recommendations. They're our contractor to help us design the solar and battery. Um, we attended a microgrid controller demo just yesterday with with the Agito uh, Technologies, and uh, they have a great product. We have weekly construction and planning meetings with the school, uh, with representatives from the town and the project management team and the architects and the CTA and some of the subcontractors. I attend the monthly middle school building committee meetings and provide updates to them on the process and what we're doing. So um, you can always catch me giving updates to them. Um, and then we're in constant communication with Gail Dowd, who's the town's procurement person and, and identified um, uh, person dedicated to this project with Carrie, with Dr. Hunter um, and other stakeholders. And then our plan is to get these RFPs ready, um, one for the rooftop solar at alternate with the canopies and then the other for the battery storage um, project. And then, you know, at this point, I'd love Warren, if, if you could, you know, facilitate a discussion on the board just to give feedback on, on this. I know I provided some other interim updates um, via email before this, but just I'd love to hear the board's thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, um, as folks can hear, even though um, solar projects have no moving parts, this project has lots of moving parts. And there are lots of different directions it could go. And I'd like to, we'll take questions and comments in a minute, but where I want us to end up is to basically give our um, sense to Jason and others on the staff that we understand that the highest priorities are to get this project done well and to get it at an appropriate cost for the ratepayers. That's much more important than the timetable. If the project has to wait extra months or even an extra year, that seems well worth it if we end up with a successful project. Um, so let me go to um, board questions and comments. John. Yeah, no, I, I was uh, I was just going to um, totally agree with your um, your uh, characterization there, Warren. Uh, and as Jason has outlined it, I think it uh, makes total sense that um, we are deliberate about uh, how we proceed here. And that um, you know we make sure that you know we're very careful in terms of um, not doing anything that's going to potentially void warranties. I'm recognizing that the, you know these are facilities that have long useful lives, um, and that the benefits will be realized eventually. Um, one minor comment, uh, Jason, was you had kind of suggested that there was a desire to kind of maximize the uh, the credits. Um, presumably enabled by the IRA and, and made specific reference to the domestic content bonus. Um, it's our experience that in some instances, it's not always the case that the incremental cost for securing domestic content can be higher than the value of the credit. So I'm just assuming that um, there will be a desire to be, you know, you, you'll be mindful of that and that the objective is to secure effectively the you know lowest cost to customers. Absolutely, yeah, and also time leads. We, we heard that some of the battery storage devices that have, that meet the, the requirements for domestic content are considerably longer lead times. And so, yeah, I agree. We're, we would not require those things, but we would look at that to just to understand the impact and probably use language that would, you know, allow us to understand what the benefit would be, what the cost would be if we did or didn't do that. Yeah, but that's a great point, thank you. Brian. Um, yeah, I, I these things are complicated. Um, I agree with Warren's statement um, about you know the interest of the rate payers being flexible. Um, so with the roof, um, the original uh, design that was proposed to the town had ballast and windbreaker, uh, a windbreaking design. Uh, for that rooftop uh, array to avoid any any confusion on you know adhesion you know 
fusing to the roof member itself or any kind of punctures. Um, that was a, a selling point. So um, I want to make sure that we're careful about what you're you're talking about, which is liability for any kind of roof leaks and things like that. Um, the canopy, uh, those are very deep and large concrete uh, you know, pieces that go in the ground, uh, much larger than we'd first thought um, that you, you described as the soil uh, being the reasoning. Um, so the canopies are, are in, in order for that property to meet its goal of net zero, uh, the roof alone will not support that. So we will need some kind of canopy um, to meet that goal uh, at the property. Uh, but scaling back or, or figuring that out based on cost and having as an option makes a lot of sense. The switch gear, uh, I'm very happy to hear that the switch gear is going to be able to allow that property to isolate with the battery, the production, and the, the building itself. Um, that, is, that is an important goal that uh, might have easily gotten overlooked. Uh, separating out those components such that someone can bid on the batteries and someone else can bid on the solar uh, because those are their specialties is, a, is also a good idea. The biggest concern is community expectations. Um, they really expected when this, the opening day, it was, a, it was a point made in many of those meetings at town meeting that they didn't, they didn't believe the light plant would do the project if it didn't get forced to do it as the date of the, of the school opening. So um, I think communication there about the interest of ratepayers and lowering the expense of the whole project needs to be communicated to the community um, in the paper or something to that effect um, to really get everybody on the same page that we're doing this in the interest of the ratepayers. Um, it might take a little longer than we'd all like, um, but we had a whole solar task force about getting in town solar. So hearing a year delay will will upset some people, uh, but we need to be pragmatic and and really communicate well uh, to the community, community that we are still doing it. It is, we're just doing it in a manner that's more financially prudent um, and that will come to fruition. And that's, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Any other board comments on this? Well, thanks. I, yeah, I'm not sure we need any sort of vote, but I think, Jason, you know, you've heard that the board is not going to insist on this um, solar project being done on the day the school opens, if that doesn't make sense, and that we should act flexibly and responsibly. And some of it is has to do with the cost of the project, but some of it also has to do with some of these issues you raise in terms of risk and liability for other um, structural problems at the school that we want to avoid. Okay, right. So I think our next item here is to suspend the regular meeting and open a rate hearing. Would somebody like to make a motion to um, suspend the meeting and open a rate hearing? Alice. Um, I agree that we should now suspend the, meet, the regular meeting of the Concord Municipal Light Board and go into um, a light hearing session of the light board to return to open meeting yeah. at the yeah. conclusion. Great. And is there a second? Brian. Okay. Brian, do you approve? Uh, yes. Bianca? Alice? Yes. John? Yes. I do as well. Okay, we're in a rate hearing. And let me remind you, this is something we discussed at the last meeting, which was to create a um, special rate option for an individual who would like to donate their RECs um, and not receive payment for it. 
It just gives an additional option for folks who have solar if they choose to go this route. Um, this seems straightforward. I'm hoping we could just move on this very quickly. Um, this reflects what we had previously discussed at the board meeting. Does anybody have any questions about this or comments? Hearing none, let's take a vote to approve this new rate. Um, uh, real quick, Warren, I think I think you need to leave the rate hearing to vote it. Brian, is that right? Oh, um, um, I think we also have to hear from the public. Right. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Let's hear from any public comments on this. Pamela Dritt. Hi, Pamela Dritt, 13 Concord Green. I think you need to make it high enough of a compensation to make it a actual incentive for people to do this because we need to do this also. I think that you need to have a program for, for um, that would allow uh, local generated solar to not have to go through outside aggravate, agri, agri, Daters. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, benefit Concord specifically. So Thank you. Let me point out that this particular rate we're dealing with last meeting, we approved a different rate, which provided compensation for someone who was, wants to um, turn over their recs to the town. This is specifically for someone who, for whatever reason, doesn't want any compensation. This is strictly for someone who wants to donate their recs. Um, are there any other public comments? Okay, so tell me on the process what we need to do now. We go out of the rate hearing? Yeah, it would end the rate hearing and then you can make a motion to take a vote to adopt the rate. Okay, do we have to make a motion to end the rate hearing or we could yeah. just, yeah. okay. Can we have a motion to end the rate hearing? I move that we end the uh, rate hearing and go return to the full board jet for a vote on the proposed rate structure for a uh, donation of Rex to the town. Thank you. And I have a second. Second. Brian. And um, Alice, do you approve? I do. Brian. I do. Brian, Bianca. I do. John. I do. I do as well. Okay. So we're now in, back in the regular meeting. Um, can we have a motion to approve this rate? I move we approve this rate. Right. If you could just Thank mention you. the name, the REC 2 rate, that would, I think, be better. I move we approve rate REC 2, the Residential right. Service Renewable Energy Credit Donation Program. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thanks. And Alice, do you approve? I do. Bianca? I do. John? I do. Brian? I do. And count me in as well. Thank you very much. And our last topic is liaison and public comments. Do we have any liaison comments first? Do we have any public, Colin Reed? And just so folks know, Colin is now the liaison from the Finance Committee on the um, board and we welcome her to that role. So Colin. Thank you, Warren. You stole my thunder. That was the only thing I was going to say. So <laughs> thank you. And I do feel very appreciated. Glad to be here. See ya. Thank you. Any other public comments? Pamela Dritt. Uh, 13 Concord Green, Pamela Dritt. Thank you for all of the reforms that you've made 
in making this much easier for the public to follow what's going on in the meetings. And I appreciate uh, the the consideration for the the um, middle school because how well something's done is as important as the thing itself because if we do it badly, it can stop a really good idea from ever getting implemented ever again. And an example is the installation of the fast chargers, which can't be used by the majority of electric cars. That was a problem that should have been anticipated and avoided. Um, and I think when we're looking for a director, a new director, we need a committed environmentalist who understands the threat and the cost of the climate crisis and sees their main role as decarbonizing and modernizing the energy supply in total, not just supplying electricity at the cheapest um, current rate possible. Need more long-term thinking. Uh, they need to have a real understanding of the ultimate goal to electrify everything and green the grid. And we need to find creative ways of economically transitioning to a green distributed grid locally that encourages local sour, solar power generation and local grid distributed storage. Please consider that in the um, director search. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another public comment. You're on mute. Uh, Phil, I think you're muted. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yep. Now we can. Great. Um, uh, Phil Fair, um, 36 uh, Mill Run Lane. Um, and uh, I appreciate the um, the opportunity to um, that, that the board is taking to reconsider um, governance. And I just wanted to um, let the board know that um, an overwhelming majority of the 41 municipal light plants um, have um, separate elected light boards and the light board has the full authority to um, appoint the, to, to hire the um, general manager. So this is an opportunity for Concord to, to get in line with majority of the other um, uh, 41 light plant towns in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Any other comments? With that, can I entertain a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Bianca. And Bianca? Y yes. Yes. <laughs> and Brian? Uh, yes. And John? Yes. Alice? Yes. And I agree as well. And we are done and we will see you next month. Thanks very much, everyone.